I'm Sebastian St. James. How can I protect my income and how much should I be investing outside of super? Super in Australia has sweet tax discounts. But what if I need my money before retirement? The answer is you will. There's a very high chance that you will need to draw down on your savings, at least to some extent, before you retire. There are four reasons why you might need your money outside of super. In Australia right now, in these modern days, there's very few people who actually work every day of their life, every year, right up till the time they retire. Do you know, in times gone past, this used to be fairly common. People had jobs for life. Maybe your grandfather worked manufacturing automobiles, and then your father worked doing the same job, and you're going to work the same job, and your son, no, chances is he won't be getting that job because that job will have moved overseas. So for most people, outside of, say, some select government organisations, even they retrench sometimes. Or if you own your own companies, for example, that's a pretty good way of keeping your job. Most people actually don't work for that long in any one particular job. Take a look. Jobs mobility in Australia. Australia's job mobility is a long way from job for life. In fact, it's closer to three jobs per decade. Today, the national average tenure in a job is 3.3 years, three years and four months, based on voluntary turnover of around about 15% per annum. That's right, in Australia right now, your average job will last for 3.3 years. And no, that isn't the rest of your life. Sometimes you get to choose when you want to quit your job. Hopefully you've got another one lined up and ready to go. Other times, no, you have no choice in the matter at all. Redundancies, restructures, you're no longer needed and out you go. The question is, if you're out of work, how long on average does it take for you to find another job? Is it one month? Is it one year? Well, here's an article that tells you the answer. How long does it really take to find a new job? Making the decision to search for a new job is not an easy one. The truth is, in today's competitive market, it takes considerably more time and energy to find employment than it did a decade ago. In fact, 75% of Australians who are currently seeking for a new job have been looking for up to six months. This article comes from Seek Australia. The question is, do you have enough money to cover all your expenses every 3.3 years for six months? No, I didn't think you did. Besides looking after yourself between jobs, the second most important reason why people need their money outside of super, and one which most people don't even talk about, is you becoming unwell. Or if you work in a physical job, your body just wears out. The body of thousands of plumbers, nurses, and other such similar professions often wear out during their 50s, like physically wear out, as in shoulder joints, elbow joints, your body physically breaking down. If you put enough stress on it day after day, like plumbers do for sure, the chance of you being able to work through to your 67 is not particularly high. Reason number three, and the single most commonest reason why people retire early, age discrimination, forced retirement. New research of Australia's oldest workers have found that experiences of age discrimination in the workplace have almost doubled in the last five years. According to the Australian Senior Series Aging in the Workplace 2021 report, one in five workers, 20.7%, aged over 50, have encountered age discrimination in the workplace. Twice as many compared to 2016, which was 9.6%. Just over 40% say they have felt patronised in the workplace because of their age. But you are probably too old to even know what to do about it. See? Age discrimination starting already. I personally know of people who have had work in a field for the last 40 years, get over 50, are unable to find work in their same profession that they've been doing for decades, and that's purely down to age discrimination. So it is rife, particularly in some industries more than others. Management get it a lot easier, and the average worker, not so much. In a previous video, one of my viewers said, awesome video, excellent content. Ah, thanks James. I really need to review my super versus outside investing. The issue is, if you want to retire early, you have to invest outside of super and take the tax hit. But that sense of freedom can cost you so much money in the long run. 
is absolutely correct. So we can add reason number four of why you need money out of super. Not everybody wants to work until the day they're ready for their Zimmer frame. And if you want to retire early, you definitely need money outside of your super. So for the average person, even if you don't want to retire early, you need two pots of money. One in your super, that's pretty obvious, but pot number two outside of your super, if for no other reason than to tie you over between jobs. The question is, at what age can you actually access your super? If you're born between 1960, the preservation age, that's the age when you can access your super, is 55. How nice for you. If not, it goes to 56, 57, right down to 60. So if you're born after July 1964, which includes me, 60 years of age is the very first time you can access your super. Now, that's accessing your super, that is not accessing the pension, which comes much later. This is Andrea. Andrea is a librarian who loves her job, and she plans to work right up until the age where she can get the pension. If you're born between 1952 and 1953, it's 65 years and 6 months, then 66 years, or if you're born on 1957 or afterwards, it's 67 years of age. As Andrea was born in 1990, she will not be getting her pension until 67, or will she? In reality, it's more likely to be 70. More recently, the Liberal Party proposed to raise the retirement age to 70 by 1935, a plan unveiled at the 2014 federal budget. While gradual increases to retirement age by six months every two years began in 2017, plans to push eligibility past the age of 67 were abandoned. Now, that was stated Liberal government policy, which they then retracted, but it is stated policy. It is something that they wanted, and retirement age has actually been going up and up and up consistently. My mother and father were eligible for their pension at the age of 60 and a half. You know, that wasn't that many decades ago. Now, it's 67. It is going up. It will go up. When? I suspect over the next decade or so. It won't be long. Now, that's a pension. Fortunately, there's been no talk about raising actual superannuation access date. Or has there? In 2014, the Treasurer, Joe Hockey, floated the idea of increasing the age at which people can access their super savings, though it has not been taken up by the Coalition or Labour. But it is something that is not likely to go away, with the Grattan Institute also supporting a higher access age to beyond 60. The Productivity Commission says lifting the preservation age to 65 could save the federal budget up to 7 billion a year by 2055. These things do not go away. On my 80th birthday, would I be surprised if the pension age is still 67 and the access to super age is still 60? Yes, extremely surprised. So Andrea's possible future, because she's fairly young, is she'll get access to a super at 65 and a pension at 70. Oh, let's add in. Age discrimination after 50, it's also a strong possibility for Andrea. Somebody famous once says, there are known unknowns and unknown unknowns. That means there are things which you don't even know exactly when they're going to happen, unknowns, but you know they're likely to happen. So known unknowns. Would you take the risk of not insuring yourself against known unknowns? For example, car insurance. Who needs that? We know there's a strong possibility that you might, therefore it's a known unknown. What about house and contents insurance? Should you actually play the numbers game and not even bother with it? That's a known unknown. What about being out of work and needing money to tide you over? Equally a known unknown, so perhaps you need some form of insurance against that. For most people, the answer is yes. Having 100% of your savings locked away in super, it's a good idea as far as tax concessions are concerned, but the risks for most people are far too high. If, say at the age of 50, you're no longer able to work because of injury or age discrimination, that's like 10 years until you get access to any of your money which is locked up in super. Can you survive until then? So, the question is, what is the answer? Well, it's simple. It's set yourself up an income continuity fund. What you do is this, you take your pay that you get every week, every fortnight, every month, you put a percentage aside away for your income continuity fund. What percentage should you put away? Should it be 5%, should it be 10%, should it be 20%? It really comes down to how much risk you're expecting 
in your life. Let's take 10% as an example. This is Andrea's current income. 10.5% of her income goes straight into super. Tax is taken out at whatever tax rate she's on. And now, something she's creating for herself, her income continuity is 10% of her wage, which she's putting away. And we're using 10% here as an example. What's this income continuity all about? Well, that's when you're out of work and you don't get a job. Sure, that actually counts for the time when you're over 50, you may never get another job, but it's also usable right now when you're younger and you're in between jobs. Whenever there's no income coming in, that's when you can use your own self-insurance, your income continuity fund. The idea of having a structured way of putting aside a pot of money purely to protect you against your lack of income in the future is something that most people aren't even bothering to do. Like most insurance, once the emergency happens, it's too late to take out insurance then. So you really need to start planning from today. The question in this video was asked by James Taylor, but I noticed here's something very unusual against his name. It's a golden circle with a number three plus beside it. What could that possibly mean? That means that James has actually been a valuable member of my channel for over three months. In fact, four. Do you know within the period which he's been a member, so many things have changed. I've been adding perks at a frantic rate to the point where my introduction video no longer made sense. It was too much out of date, so I've just recorded a new one. And these are some of the brand new perks since James originally joined up. Members now get exclusive members only videos. Oh, wow. You also get members shout outs. And your questions are actually prioritized over non-members. Wow, that's a major perk. And you get early access to new videos. Hmm, nice. So thank you, James, very much for being a member. And if you'd like to get a bunch of perks, just like James, hit the join button below this video. So you're putting aside, say, 10% every pay into your income continuity fund. The question is, exactly where should that money go? Well, let's have a look. You've got the two obvious options are into a high interest savings account or into the stock market. Where particular in the stock market? Well, it could be the S&P 500, it could be the ASX 200, it could be into blue chip shares, wherever. That I've covered in many, many videos in the past. The question now is, how do you know whether you should be putting your money into shares or keeping it in cash? This is Mary. She operates the last manual exchange in Kalamunda in Western Australia. Hi Mary, I've got bad news for you. You are soon to be replaced by technology. There's not going to be any manual operating exchanges going forward. So I would suggest for you, you probably want to keep your money in a high interest savings account because you may need it very, very soon. This is Susan. Susan's a doctor. Hi Susan, I've got very good news for you. As a doctor, they're crying out for doctors. So the chance of you losing your job is not particularly high. Therefore, an ideal place for you may well be to keep your money in the share market. Why? Because the share market is ideal for long periods of time. And that's probably how long you'll be investing for. Right, so it really comes down to my exact profession, to how likely I'm gonna be out of work and therefore exactly where I need to put my money. The question is, there is risk associated with the share market. There's less risk associated with high interest savings account. Well, not really. There's also the risk of losing your money due to inflation and having your value eaten away. That's a real risk that most people don't even think about. The question is, where is the risk versus the reward as far as those two are concerned? This is the high interest savings account, the HISA over the last 20.6 years. The data is real. That index though is something I've created. You will not find it anywhere else. It's completely unique to me. But wait, my god powers of creating indices have now been upskilled. Not only do I have the power to create brand new indices, a power reserved only for me and the standard and pause, I now have a brand new power. I have created my first derivative index. That's right, an index created on another index. Here it is. This is the HISAC. Oh, it's got a C on the end. What could that mean? This is the high interest savings account with bonus interest cumulative. Oh, that's new. 
The underlying index, which is the HISA, High Interest Savings Account, actually just has the raw figures of the interest rate. 3% here, 6% there, but it's not accumulative. That means growing over time. What the HISC, C for cumulative, does is it assumes that you put $1,000 in a bank account and you take those interest rates every single month and you grow your money over time. Literally, it's that money growing. Take a look, the HISA, C. Yeah, we started at $1,000, we're growing, 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 and by the end, we're kind of like 1.9 thousand, aren't we? Of course, I always use my index god powers for good, for now. So what it means is I can now actually plot your money in the bank, your high interest savings account, right against if you put that money in the share market at exactly the same year and month throughout history. So we're actually comparing like for like. These are not some just averages. These are actually historically accurate figures. Here it is. Here is the HISAC versus the XJTF over 10.1 years. What does this mean? Are these all your own indices? Well, yes, they are. This is the high interest savings account with bonus interest cumulative versus the ASX 200 total return plus franking credits. So it includes dividends as well. And over that period of time, 10.1 years, you could see the red line, which of course is the share market, is going up, up. It's had a bit of a dip, but look, it's so far above the blue line, didn't really matter, and up and up. Wow, that is a big difference. How much of a difference? If you left your money in the bank, which is the HISAC, you would have returned 24.9%. If you'd stuck it in the Australian share market and got your franking credits, it was 176%. Wow, that is a difference. The bank had a CAGR of 2.23%. The share market had a CAGR of 10.5%. Wow, it's like night and day. So sure, there are risks for having your money in the share market. I mean, the share market could crash by 40%. It happens, it happens a lot. But as you can see, over time, it doesn't really matter. It outgrows that as long as you've got the time. But be warned, it's not always smooth sailing like that graph I showed you showed you. Here is the HISAC versus the XPXTR over 20.6 years. Well, that's of course your bank account versus the S&P 500 total return. And if you look in those early years, oh, okay, it's a bit hard to see. Zoom in. Enhance. Oh yes, there you go. The blue line at some stage was actually above the share market. If you needed your money at that exact point, sometimes you would have actually been better if your money was in the bank. So when should you put your money in a high interest savings account and when is it better actually put it in the share market and is there a way I can tell the difference? Well, if you answer these questions, I'm typically only out of a job for a month or two. The idea of income continuity is that you squirrel away money every single pay. So it could be there for years, it could be there for decades. If you're only out of work for a month or two, then you're taking in a small amount of that back for sure, but most of it gets to grow over time. So 100% shares could be the right thing for that. I have a very stable job, but I'm worried about age discrimination in say a decade. You've got a decade, the chances is that your money in the share market will outgrow many times the option of leaving your money in a high interest savings account, which is not so high interest savings account if you look back over a decade. So in that case, 100% invested in shares is probably the right option. I'm in an industry quickly being replaced by another technology. My skill set will soon be worthless. If you're fearful that you'll actually need your money, perhaps all of it, very soon, for example, like Mary, the manual switchboard operator, then you probably want to keep your money in a high interest savings account because you don't really have the time for the money to grow. And if it's only going to be invested for a year or two, it may be better off sitting in the bank. So whether you should invest your money in the bank or put it in the share market, it ultimately is a you question. But I've given you the data and exactly what you need to consider this for yourself. So we've talked about the investment side of things. The question is, how does this income protection system work in the first place? Well, let's take a look. Step number one, you choose a percentage of your wage, each pay you want to invest. For example, it could be 5%, it could be 20%. It's totally up to your choice. Could that be 0%? I am in a job which I think will last for life. Well, yes, it could be 0%, no problems at all. But the question is, what happens if you lose your health? Your job might last, but maybe you don't. So to say I want to invest nothing before retirement could leave you a danger. 
Or you might say, hang on, my job is really, really risky. I'm a contractor. I don't know from one moment to the next whether I'm going to be employed. Well, yes, you may need to up your rate more than 20%. The reality is some jobs just do not have longevity. Built into the job itself, you are unlikely to be working later on. For example, you may be a model. In which case, a figure more like 50% might make sense. Step number two, if you lose your job, use your redundancy first. Your redundancy is specifically to tie you over between your jobs. You get to use it first. Only then, after you've used it, do you even consider drawing down on your income protection continuity fund. Step number three, if you're out of work, you've got no redundancy left, then you get to withdraw your income. But it's not just your normal income. It's your income minus your savings amount from your income continuity investments. That's right. Let's say you've been investing 10% of your money into your continuity fund. So when you're out of work, you get to live on 100% of your income? No, of course not. You weren't living on that to start with, so you live on that 90%. Now, there could be other sorts of savings that you've been doing. You may be saving for your children's education. You may be savings for some emergency fund. The thing is, once you're out of work, is not the time for you to continue saving. So the amount that you actually get to withdraw from your income continuity fund is the amount that you got in your wage minus all the amounts that you took out for your various savings programs and the raw amount, in other words, what you really need for your bills, is the amount that you get to withdraw from your income continuity fund. Step number four, adjust the savings amount up and down based on your perceived level of risk as you age. Maybe you're 30 and you think, yep, 10% is enough. I've got decades, I probably won't be out of work. And then later on, you find out that one of your friends who's only five years older than you can't find another job. Age discrimination, yes, I know. And therefore you think, I should be starting to up the amount. So increase or decrease perhaps the amount as you age based on your perceived risks. Step number five, any money left over once you retire is yours to keep. This is the best insurance policy in the entire world. Do you normally get to pay premiums into an insurance fund? And then if you don't actually claim on it, they give you the money back? No, of course not. Don't be stupid. But in this insurance fund, yes, you do. Let's go back to James' original question. The issue is if you want to retire early, you have to invest outside of super. He's absolutely right. So if you're going to retire early, that means before 60, not before 67 then you will not have access to your super. By definition, you have to actually invest outside of super. Sure, it's good that super has all the tax discounts, but if your stated aim is to retire before you're 60, then by definition, you'll need a second pot of money for your early retirement. It cannot be tied up in super. So let's look at how you might actually calculate that. Step number one, how much will I need to live off per year? So you work that out. How many years will my early retirement last for? So you could say, I want to live off $80,000 and I'm going to retire 10 years early. That's $800,000, but wait, that does not actually factor in inflation. So the two things you need to factor in is what's the expected market return, because that will reduce the amount that you actually need to save. And have you factored in inflation? Inflation means two things. Inflation means that the amount that you actually want to live on, say $80,000 now, $80,000 in 10 years, it's not going to be worth near as much. So you better up it by what you expect inflation to be. The second part is year one. That amount might be good, but of course it's going to be eroded over time. So it may be $80,000 or whatever the equivalent value is in 10 years. And then every year you need it up by inflation. In theory, once you plug the data into a math equation, you can work out exactly how much you need, add in a bit of a fudge factor because you never know what's going to go on with the economy. And once you've got that amount, you're ready to retire. But the bottom line is, whether you're planning to retire early or whether you're definitely not retiring early, most people will need a certain amount of money outside of super because the two things in life that are certain are death and taxes, but employment, full employment for the rest of your working life is certainly not guaranteed. So I take all my money from my income continuity fund. I choose some amazing companies, some stable companies that should last me for the rest of my life. So I'm never ever gonna to have to sell up those shares. And of course, unless I'm out of work, is that right? The answer is no, you 
will have to sell your shares. Click here to find out why, or if you've seen that, click here.